Hello, my name is Anne Marie Cannon, and I'm the host of Armchair Historians. What's your favorite history? Each episode begins with this one question. Our guests come from all walks of life. YouTube celebrities, comedians, historians, even neighbors from the small mountain community that I live in. They're people who love history and get really excited about a particular time, place, or person from our distant or not so distant past. The jumping off point is the place where they became curious, then entered the rabbit hole into discovery. Fueled by an unrelenting need to know more, we look at history through the filter of other people's eyes. Armchair Historians is a Belgian Rabbit production. Stay up to date with us through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Wherever you listen to your podcast, that is where you'll find us. Armchair Historians is an independent, commercial-free podcast. If you'd like to support the show and keep it ad-free, you can buy us a cup of coffee through Ko-fi, or you can become a patron through Patreon. Links to both in the episode notes. Hello, fellow Armchair Historians. It's been a while since last we met here, and that's because I recently took a long, much-needed cross-country road trip in which I reconnected with family and friends. It was so good to see and be in the space of some of the people I love the most. I also used the 40-hour round-trip drive to catch up on my favorite podcasts, some of my faves being Civics and Coffee, Care More Be Better, Ye Old Crime Podcast, and Horrifying History, just to name a few. Check out the episode notes to see a list of other podcast recommendations. Another highlight of the trip was helping my daughter get settled in her new house in a new town, which has an amazing historical backstory, and bonding with my grand puppy Wiley. He's a good dog. Anyway, I'm glad to be back in this space connecting with you. I have some really interesting guests coming up in the near future and have begun laying down the groundwork for our first limited series about 19th century enigmatic entrepreneur extraordinaire Charles H. Utter, a.k.a. Colorado Charlie. Stay updated on all things Armchair Historians through our social media. You can find us on Twitter at username armchair histor one on instagram at armchair historians and on facebook at armchair historians in this episode i interview memoirist and award-winning poet jason summer now jason is the author of five poetry collections most recently portulans in the university of chicago's phoenix Poets series. Today, however, Jason talks to me about his beautifully written new memoir, Schmuel's Bridge, which will be released March 1st of this year. It is currently available for pre order. Against the backdrop of the Holocaust, Schmuel's Bridge sees history through a double lens the memories of a growing son's complex relationship with his father, and the meditations of that son who, now grown, finds himself caring for a man, losing all connection to a past that must not be forgotten. Jason Summer, welcome to Armchair Historians. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so we're just going to start out with the question and see where we go. I, uh, I do want to tell you that I did start reading the book, and it's beautiful. You are obviously a poet the way you write. So um, let's just get into the question. Uh, what's your favorite history that we're going to be talking about today? Well, the history that we'll be talking about makes the question of favorite a little difficult. It's the history of the Holocaust as background to a, a memoir, a prose memoir, that I've written. Nobody gets driven away quite as thoroughly as when you mention poetry. And it's, it's not a poem. It's an a memoir that, for the, back, the background of which is my uh, father's Holocaust story and the Holocaust stories of my family. It's a history that I wouldn't call favorite, but, but seems assigned to me by my background, essentially. I've embraced an interest in it and tried to um, immerse myself somewhat in it. I'm, I'm not an expert, but I've made myself, I've educated myself with regard to my, my family's story, anyhow. So, and you have a book that is coming out or just came out? Uh, Out March 1st, uh, called Shmuel's Bridge. Yeah. 
Schmoll's Bridge. So I think we're going to be talking about the the book and the memoir. I like I said, I started reading it. I don't know what happens to Schmoll, so I'm really <laughs> curious. And I know that has a lot to do with the book. But uh, like I said, the the way you write, it just there's so many layers in each word and each sentence, and it's really beautifully written. So well, thank you. With that, let's talk about um, why is the name of the book Schmuel's Bridge? Well, Schmuel is uh, my father's youngest brother. He had two brothers, and Schmuel made an escape attempt from a, a transport to Auschwitz, a train transport from his hometown Munkach to uh, to Auschwitz, and the book. It's at the center of, of the book. Uh, it's my father's deepest grief about the Holocaust, despite all that my father suffered. Dad's biggest wound, really, is the loss of his of his kid brother. We attempted to find the place where he made where Shmuel made his escape attempt. It was a, a way for me to uh, give my father something that was, it's a complicated gift, anything with the Holocaust is, but to contribute in some way to my father's understanding of what happened there and to also honor, honor the memory by trying to go there and be at that place and be more closely associated in some way with what happened to Shmuel. It was also on a trip to Eastern Europe that was originally designed for me to visit the, the places of my father's Holocaust and his hometown, his home village, which is outside Munkach, which is now in the Ukraine. It's a, it's a much traveled city uh, in the sense that, that it's now in the Ukraine. It was Austro-Hungary. It was Czechoslovakia for a, a, a time. Then it was given to Hungary post-World War I as part of the redrawing of the, the boundaries of Europe. And we essentially uh, followed the tracks from Munkach to Auschwitz and visited other places too, in, in, including where my father was interned, labor, labor camp, forced labor, slave labor, and uh, traversed also the places, some of the places he traveled when the Russians liberated him. He was an a reluctant volunteer in, t in, in the Russian army and traversed what was then Czechoslovakia, Slovakia and the Czech Republic now. It's been 2001, so it's, it's quite yeah. some time ago. Well, I can, in, in ways I can relate with this. My mother was born in Belgium and in World War I, her family was executed by the Germans. She wasn't Jewish, but... Then in World War II, when she's eight years old, the Germans are coming again after the, what they called the Rape of Belgium. And we went back in 2012, kind of similar, but different. And we, we went to the different places that they were on. The, the legend is the last train leaving Belgium. We went to all those places. And so I understand that. And it, the book and the concept really resonates with me. Now, it's interesting because it's a memoir from two perspectives. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I'm anxious that it not be mistaken for a biography of my father. Because, right. in fact, it's, it's a memoir, and it's about fathers and sons, or <laughs> this son and that father, who is going to be 99 in the coming year. And he's still with us. He is still with us. He is still with us. Uh, part of the impetus of the book, as you know from, from the beginning, is preserving the memory because his memory is uh, now going. There was some extra urgency to uh, getting this stuff down. N not that he consulted all that much with this, but he's here still. <laughs> And watching what happens to memories in the memory of the Holocaust, what I think of as the mortality, not of just of us, but the mortality of our memories, which are breakable. It's the story of living with those stories and what one does with them. Part of the, my eagerness or my, 
I don't know what to call it, I, I, my drive really to to find the place that Shmuel died was also to not be just the recipient of story all the time. It's a kind of a, a mixed motivation that I, I find in myself, you know, being so much in a generation that had it much softer. I mean, every generation had it much softer than the people who'd gone through the Holocaust, but wanting to assume a kind of majority of my own so that I could do some research and I could lead the way in a way um, to, to, to that place. So it was a, an exchange of a gift for the pain of memory and you know, on my father's part, but it also was an effort to be an adult with him. It's very hard to be an adult when the experience across the way from you makes your life seem less in some way, less authentic, certainly less full of challenge. I mean, my father is a figure. He escaped. He was in the Russian army, and he came to the United States with an incomplete education you know, it, not even completed in terms of elementary school. And he ended up uh, two master's degrees, ABD, and National Teacher of the Year. He always wanted to teach, and he, he knows many languages, 10 languages. And he had many opportunities to do other things. But he wanted to be a teacher and became a really a superb one by anybody's standards. Now, you didn't set out to write this memoir, I think I read. How did that come about? How did that, well, how did you move into this? I had been writing poems, narrative poems, poems with stories about my father's experience and my aunt's experience. She's an Auschwitz survivor. And just the dynamic of uh, my aunt refused to speak. And my father always spoke about it, or very, very soon. Um, in my childhood, I remember him being much more explicit and my aunt cutting off conversation utterly. So it was a, a long process that involved a lot of writing. But then as my father's memory began to go, I thought, no, this, this shouldn't vanish. Nor should the, the contest with it, the struggle with it vanish. And so one thing that I, I represent in the book is not just the preservation of the memory, but the cost of all of that. And, you know, not just, not poor me, but the cost in looking at these things really hard. And what you get for that, in terms of an understanding you know, of history, but also of the way history impacts on the most personal relationships that you can have with your mother, with your father. So it's history and right down to the granular level. Yeah. Right. Oh, it is. And I I have a belief that we carry our history and our DNA. And I know when I went back to these places with my mother where they got on the last train, where she walked to the train station under artillery, uh, German artillery fire, and when we went to the place where the monument to her uh, first World War relatives who were executed were, um, there was a healing inside of me. And I don't know if you experienced this. There was a healing um, in the sense of recognizing in a way that you can't even put into words how I carry that inside of me through being raised by my mother, whatever DNA memory I have. Um, and even though it's uncomfortable and painful to go back and look at those things, I also felt that my mother, who is a very difficult person to have as a mother, I saw something happen inside of her that was, I believe it was like a healing. It was a return to where she lost her innocence at the age of eight. And um, I'm wondering if you had any of those experiences uh, in your journey and your experience with your dad. Much of the journey was about getting closer to him, getting uh, past the story by getting through the story in a much uh, more proximate way than I could before. Uh, I had refused uh, the opportunity when it presented itself uh, earlier. The town was cut off by uh, 
the Soviet Union because it had some military installations in it, a factory for armament and a, a more importantly, a, a radar station of some sort. So we couldn't, he couldn't go back. He couldn't go back to see his mother's grave. And he wanted me to come with him when I, and when I felt able to, I could, when I felt I had enough life under me <laughs> and uh, enough accomplishments so that I felt I could enter again to this, this large life um, that was near mine, so near mine. And so there were a number of episodes where, you know, at his mother's grave with his, with his son at, at his labor camp where he thought he wouldn't get out of that. Areas that he had, had traveled through where his life was under threat and uh, the bridge itself, which I, I kind of, I don't know whether I should hold back you know, it's it's a it's a moment of climax in the book. Do I give the game away? No, don't give it away. Don't give it away because I want to. I'm in the middle of reading it. I'm invested, and I want to. I want to know what happens. I know that something important happens there. So, well, something important happens all along the way, and there's a particular vulnerability in my father. He he began to tell the story in his life. You know, he had a public forum after a while. He was appointed by President Reagan to the Excellence Commission. And he began, he, he spoke about the Holocaust to larger audiences than just the family. And there becomes a kind of, both for the survivor and I think the survivor's family, there's a kind of a, a covering that, you know, the story gets to be, if not wrote, then, then practiced in some way so that they can bear telling it. And, and there's a way to consider the audience, you know, so, you, so it's not so abject, so it's not so horrible. And, and in that way, the stories get remote, or, or they, they're withdrawn a step or two, and, and we closed in on the story, and we're willing, both of us from either side, to do that. And we got closer. Uh, we buried some of the difficulties that all, that always come with uh, families that have these terrible events in them. There's trauma. And I don't know whether it's DNA, forgive me, I shouldn't disagree with the host, but I, but I certainly, I, I think the stories that are told and the aura around a family of fear, you know, uh, of uh, sniffing the air for danger, um, it is there and, and needs to be accounted for. The stories are, are in part that, but also needs to be settled with in some way. And we did some of that, though it was painful to be in that place with my, with my father, in those places. And I was afraid always that I would fail him, that I would not be enough of comfort. Though, though my very being, in a kind of way, is seen by my father as a kind of a triumph. Uh, people tried to kill him, tried to ensure there would be no progeny, there would be no future for him, and he made a future in, in America. So having me at, at his, just at my grandmother's grave, was something for both of us. By, by all reckonings, he should not have been able to be there or anywhere. But he, he was lucky, and also, I mean, he talks about his luck all the time, and luck is a big part of things with survivors. But there's something about my father. He's got real pluck to go with his luck, you know, and his languages. Did he end up in Auschwitz? He did not. <laughs> he okay. did not. He had gone to Budapest, where the roundups of the Jews happened later. The country that the Hungarians controlled got roundups much earlier. And, you know, in, in 1944, they killed, oh gosh, from the, from the countryside, uh, around 440,000 Jews in about eight weeks. That was, the, you know, the great period of spring, summer, 44, where the, the transports went, went to Auschwitz nonstop. They, you know, war materials were, <laughs> you know, set aside for those transports transports. Um, and of course, the Hungarians were assiduous in rounding up the Jews. They were 
They had a long history of anti-Semitism, coeval in both senses with the, with the Germans. Uh, they were German allies. And even before the Germans occupied Hungary, there were pogroms and the deportations happened uh, under the impetus, the, the mass deportations happened more under the impetus of the Germans when the Germans uh, took over in March 1944. They occupied Hungary because Hungary was, their armies had been beaten badly and um, they were looking to sue for peace and the Germans weren't having that. I'm sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> I don't know, but I was with you the whole way. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, oh, I asked you if Dad ended up in Auschwitz, and you said he. Um, he didn't. No, he is, yeah, he that is, was it. He was. He was interned in. Uh, there was something called the, the labor battalions, which were ways for chiefly the Jews, politically unreliables, to be pressed into service, and they were quite, quite brutal situations. And uh, my father was in several camps, slave labor camps, labor camps, and uh, ended up in a place outside of Budapest called uh, Chepel, which was a major um, industrial complex. He escaped because, because he thought, you know, just by the treatment they were getting, he thought that it was not going to end well. And my father had had a tough childhood in a small village outside of Munkach. And he, he often said, you know, the, the lack of calories affected me less than a lot of other people there because I was used to the lack of calories, <laughs> you, you know? And um, yeah. so he, he escaped with a friend of his and went on the run. So he missed the de deportations, not by, not by a lot, from that Chepel Island, which is just outside of Budapest, there were there were deportations. I can't remember the, the exact date, but he got out a, a, ahead of them, hid out. He was supposed to have a hiding place, but it fell through, and the, f the friend with whom he escaped got you know w was hidden, and he was just on the run, and uh, hid out as a Gentile. Just you know had a very omnivorous uh, Holocaust ex experience. And so many close calls. It's, it's kind of silly that we're both still, you know, <laughs> but we're both here, <laughs> you know. Um, but right. but it was, uh, yeah, it was an experience that that was labor camp rather than death camp, which was very different, but depended on who was in charge of, uh, very locally. If you had a a guard who was very anti-Semitic and cared more about harming Jews than getting the, the labor done, you were in trouble. And escapes were you know, dealt with by execution. Your dad was how old when the war broke out? He was in his late teens, 19 or so. Depends where you, you know, the war 39, yeah. You're on 19 or so. Well, I, yeah, a lot of things led up to it, though. Uh, it started earlier for uh, the Jews. Right. So that's the other thing. I, I'm thinking about this other person that I interviewed about her grandfather. I can't remember his name. There was something that she talked about was that her grandfather, he did a lot of, he was on the run, the whole thing, but he was a young man and he was strong. And so he was able to be used as labor, and a lot of times that saved his skin. He did end up in Auschwitz, but he survived. But I, th I thought that was interesting when you were talking about your dad and his strength, and he was already used to living on few calories, like you put it. He, he was also, uh, he had been apprenticed quite early, 14, I think, or 13 or 14, to a bike mechanic, and he could weld well. And he also spoke several languages which saved him, you know, lots of difficulties, but made the Russians tremendously interested in him. So when they essentially saved his life, they also, a little bit later on, decided he needed to serve with them. It was interesting to, to pass through that landscape with him, where he had, you know, crisscrossed as a, as a soldier for those those months in the in the Russian army and. We had to cross a border at one point, and he, our papers were not in order, and we were stuck between Poland and Slovakia 
the fellow that was driving us could not go across, and we couldn't get uh, further. We had to find transport there, and it was very awkward. And I saw for the first time at that moment the extent of the fear he had of not just the social breakdown. He was, in a way, he'd spoken about when anything, everything came apart, there was opportunity for him in, in, to escape, you know, to, to keep on the run. But when the soldiers at the border, you know, said, these are the rules and you will not go further, I, I, I never uh, experienced before the, my father's almost dissolution into, into fear. Here were soldiers who were not letting him. And there was a, a terrible um, trauma was revisited, I, I think. He had snuck over borders. He was uh, afraid of it. it was, and it was shattering for me. Uh, you know, I was used to him being afraid sometimes, and he certainly, through my childhood, I remember him waking up, um, unable to sleep, and, you know, the night was busy sometimes in, in my house. And um, and also the, the anger that would burst from him. You know, he seemed to be, even when I didn't understand quite what it was, he seemed marked in some way, scarred. And the trip allowed me to view that at certain points fairly closely in ways that I hadn't before. Uh, and it shook, it shook me even as, you know, I was a middle-aged man and still there was something very deep that got stirred in me in response to what was stirred in him. Wow. That's really uh, profound. Why is this history important? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're a day away from, you know, Holocaust Remembrance Day and, and, um, Though I don't believe uh, telling the story prevents everything or most things, keeping these stories alive, especially I think, I, you know, this will sound like uh, justifying writing the, the book that I wrote, but especially to show how uh, it impacts relations and, and that it, it, it's carried for generations. It's, it needs to be remembered, not because it's, you know, remote in history, but because it, it ripples on and you want some of the ripples to be cautionary to people. Be careful of your democracy. Be careful of, of, you know, the the whisper of racism because it soon gets large when it's allowed to whisper on. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and we're in the midst of, you know, all that kind of, kind of thing here. And, and I guess I wanted to make some contribution to that. I tend to be skeptical about what it does. I I hope it does something telling the story. I, I kind of think of the, the stories as a kind of net, you know, everyone who has them should tell them because they'll catch us before we fall through to the abyss. Maybe. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Maybe. I, I was interested in, in you talking about the, the, the language of the book, which I took, I took some care with. I, you know, I write poems, and mm-hmm. poems are as much about that, getting it right in language and in a concentrated space. And I, I hope the language of the telling, compensation is not the right word, but allows a different experience that's not just of horror, you know, or, or horror recounted. But, you know, my father made something of a life, you know, that they, t- they tried to take it away, uh, the Nazis, and he made something good out of it. Even in the telling of the experience, I wanted to make something good out of it, even in the writing itself, to get closer to the emotion of things but also to show what language needs to be able to do. I'm always trying to do that. What it needs to be able to carry in a way that's itself memorable. When you talk about your childhood and, you know, the different levels of awareness, your friend who you were friends with, and then he found out he was at that age and he found out that you were Jewish and, you know, what happened in that relationship, the way that you describe it, I mean, it, I I don't know how to put this, but 
It was almost as if I wasn't reading a book, but I was there. And that's what I'm trying to say about the way that, that you write is that I could feel the different layers of what was going on. And it was enlightening, you know, in that way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well, that's, that's, that's nice. That's lovely to, to hear. The, the incident that you're talking about, the young man, uh, my childhood buddy, knew I was Jewish, but he hadn't gathered from his parents what that meant. And, um, you know, we did this calculus where he found out that Jesus was Jewish. It wasn't the first thing he found out of Jesus. He went to Catholic school and I went to yeshiva. Um, so I had my, you know, my own take on, on things. But since Jesus was Jewish, we figured, uh, as kids will, as young children will, that at some point along the way, his family must have been Jewish since they're Catholic now. And since Jesus was Jewish, there, there was some sort of conversion experience. Now, my take on things was that he brought that home to the family um, and they were not they, they were not altogether pleased with it. The little known fact is that West Side Story is is uh, was originally set between Jews and Irish. Um, and, you know, that my story, I was raised in the Bronx. The area of conflict in my neighborhood was in a, you know, working class neighborhood. There were immigrants of, of all kinds, but it was the, the Irish had been there first and were concerned to keep keep their turf. Uh, so there was a fair amount of friction and some and some anti-Semitism in the uh, including some violence that really upset my father. He didn't think it was coming again, but he was distressed to find it in America, for which he he had mm -hmm. so much hope, <laughs> about which he had so much hope, and got so much from the, from the country. Yeah. The book comes out in March 1st. Yes. Where can we find your book when it comes out? Well, you know, your local bookstore, I hope, and, and, and ordering through your local bookstore. Mine here is Left Bank Books, but it'll be widely available uh, everywhere. Charles Bridge, uh, Imagine Books from Charles Bridge uh, get, gets uh, sold. It'll be on the, you know, the major outlets <laughs> online as, as well, I I but think. your plug is for the indie bookstores. I guess. Yeah, it is yeah. for the indie bookstores because God, where would we be without them? I mean, in our local spaces, and mm. and what happens with, to local spaces? So yes, I sure. did plug my my local bookstore. If there was one thing that you would want my listeners to remember about this history, what or to know about this history, what would it be? I I I would want readers to take away. I think the. I don't know the just the grainy particulars of of the history that that history needs to be sunk into to really be understood. That you know, very few people know really. I mean, the, the awareness of the Holocaust itself has been declining according to studies, but the idea that the Hungarians were you know on this side of were allied with the Germans right now. Orban, the premier of, of uh, Hungary, is busy erasing the history. And, and I don't think history repeats itself exactly. But you need to sift it carefully to find out what does get repeated and, and you know, what the dictator's playbook is. And I'd have my, my readers just to take a, a general sense of attentiveness to what can happen any, almost anywhere, but particularly you know, to guard against those hatreds uh, and to see, also to understand how history impacts the personal. You, you can't, I mean, we don't deal with each other through history always, but there's that background. I, I don't want it to drown out the personal, um, but I, I think as a, a background and the history as uh, uh, the idea of history as, as ascertainable truth, or that delta situation where you eliminate what errors you can to get at, at as close to the truth as you can, even if that truth is uncomfortable, just it needs air and light. And, I, you know, I hope my book lends a little air and light not to the history, but, but to the impact on the persons 
and about something about fathers and sons, I think, will will resonate with everybody. Who is a is a father or a son or is around them? I don't mean to exclude exclude anybody. Uh, I don't I don't know whether that's a good enough answer for the for the takeaway of the book. Oh, it's there's no right answer. It's just what you think, and that's it. Like I said early in the interview, that it's a book from your perspective. But it's a book about your father. It's a personal take on what it was to be his son, uh, what the stories were. There's a lot of levels to the book. And it, like I said, it's beautifully written. So is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to share with my audience? No, I, I guess I just emphasize that, that it's so much about a father and a son against the backdrop of, uh, of history. It isn't really a, a history of the Hungarian Holocaust, though, that, that enters into it. And I, I, I guess a history of what it is to live with story. So many people do. Anybody who's had parents who've had it, as, as you have, <laughs> parents who've had a harder time than you, to live authentically with and against that deeply disturbing experience that may impact on a, on a family life. And how I think my book in the end shows that you, you can with effort, get over that, uh, get through it, which is, I don't know, the message of hope in the book. <laughs> well, yeah, I think the way to get over it is to go through it and to really look at it. My mother, when, when we were younger, she was like, that is in the past. Cause she had a very thick oh. French accent. And she wouldn't talk about it. And then I don't know what broke open in her. Eventually, she did start talking about it. And she got backlash from her brother about talking about it. So there's all those things. And we were in a place called La roche sur which is where they ended up in the refugee camp in France when they left Belgium. And I was interviewing her in front of a patisserie where when she it was still a patisserie in 2012 and you know I was interviewing her and then this woman walked by and my mother got really quiet and I'm like she stopped in mid-sentence and I saw that you know fear in her face discomfort and it was that moment where she's like oh that woman is you know I didn't want to upset her by talking about the war and so and, and, you know, even getting my mother to talk about it and to, to do this was like pulling teeth at times. But I kept telling her mom, and she passed away in 2017. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that she passed before I was able to complete this uh, documentary, which she eventually got on board with. Um, but, huh. um, you know, I told her, I kept saying, Mom, your people, your generation, she was eight when the war broke out. I said are dying out and we need to know the story. You need to tell me the story. I need to know the story so that we can, you know, as you said, is it a cautionary table tale? Maybe, but it's also about the different levels of humanness and how we survive. And I mean, there's just so many things when you think about your father and how he survived and the fact that his survival made it possible for you to be here talking to me today. I always marvel at that with anybody is that fact that all that it took for us to be here today in all those people's lives and what they had to deal with and how they survived. I mean, it's, and I think your book is, it does all that. It does all that. Thanks again. That it's extraordinary to think about the, the narrow moments that, that uh, our progenitors pass through that allow us to be. It's extraordinary, really extraordinary. How, you know, a little move left or right and, and you know, I wouldn't be here or in, right. in, in my current version. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. I, I was put in mind uh, when, when we traveled to his home village, we actually found somebody who knew his family, who wow. knew his father and mother, a very wow. old man. He had a perfectly pleasant conversation with this guy. And then we walked away and I realized that the man had, there was an exchange of information, including the fact he'd remembered uh, my father's brothers and, and his, his brother Shmuel and, and asked about him. And my father said he, he died. Uh. 
he was killed by the Germans. And, and you know, it was, but walking away, I thought, well, the man was another ethnic. He was a Ukrainian speaker, Rus, um, Ru- or Ruthenian. You, you know, that was uh, uh, another uh, ethnic fragment that ranged against the Jews. And my father was one of, I think, two Jewish families in, in that a little village. And I, I wondered what the man, it seemed like a, a kind of pretense. Was he, why would he be surprised? And as he did express surprise that, that uh, Shmuel had died when so many had died and he must have seen people carted off because from that area, they were, you know, the Jews were ethnically cleansed. And I, I wondered at my father's acceptance of that social moment. It was just as your mother didn't want to disturb the person passing by. My father was much more interested in in the connection and the pleasantries than he was in cutting through that to find out what this, I wanted to know what this man knew, but I was not going to take the lead lead there. And I learned something about my my grandfather and I had to be content with that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of, oh, there's a lot to unpack. And I'm glad that you're telling this story. I think it's important in the way that you're telling it. It's, it's lovely. It's art. It's, it's, it's a lullaby into horror in a way, but also with the constant understanding of survival, because we know that you're here. We know that your dad survived. Well, um, and where can we find you? Do you have a website or anything like that? I, I do. Uh, it's just my name, jasonsummer.com. Yeah, the book is available for pre-order, too. Well, and then the other thing I want to say is that I'm going to talk to my library about getting the book in and maybe doing a book club. I would like to say to my listeners that that's always an option is to let your library know about the book, ask them to get it in. That's something I just recently learned you could do. Well, thank you so okay. much for this. Oh, thank you. I really fun. enjoyed talking to you. There you have it, Jason Summer and Schmuel's Bridge. Be sure to check out our episode notes to find out more about Jason and his new memoir. Also, you can pre-order the book from preferably your local indie bookstore or wherever you buy your books. Also... Don't forget, you can suggest to your library that they carry uh, the book as well. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great week.